And there's, if you get up to a certain frequency, then we can't hear the highest pitches, right? I mean, we've all heard this. Animals may be able to hear higher frequencies than we can. And there's a limit to how low we can hear as well. Yeah? So these are things that are often studied in seventh grade. But what I'd like to do is really highlight, I'd like to highlight um, this mathematical property that states, I'll just say it first, given two notes in the same string, their frequency and string lengths are inversely proportional. Given two notes their frequency and string length. Now you understand what we were measuring is string length before. It's defined as where you're pushing your finger. It's not the actual length. There's part of the, when you push your finger down, part of the string is now dead. Okay, but it's the string that, part of the string that's actually vibrating. So their frequency and string lengths, I should say frequencies, that would be better. And string lengths are, and this is this word, inversely proportional. So this is something we try to build up to often in seventh grade is this realization. So what does that actually mean? So I'm going to give you an example that I think is quite important to understand for us to be moving forward for the rest of the evening. And the example is this. So let's imagine we have a violin, a violin A string. And so I just said that that A string is what? That's four, it's, it's 440 hertz, and it's how long? Do you remember? 32.5 centimeters. I think earlier I said inches, I meant centimeters. Um, 32.5 centimeters long. So what's going to happen then if I now compare that to the E? Well, we already know, don't we, that to get the E, how long does the string length have to be? Well, the string length is going to have to be 32.5 32 times 2 thirds, right? We're going to make it 2 thirds as long. Isn't that correct? So we have this full length on the A string, and we're going to make it 2 thirds as long. And when we multiply that out, what are we going to get there? Anybody who's got the calculator on now? OK, you want to just do that right there? Oh, actually, I have it right before me. OK, so this is going to be 21 and 2 thirds centimeters. That's the length of the string. And what did we do there? We multiplied by 2 thirds because the ratio was 3 to 2. But now what I'm going to do when I calculate the frequency, I'm going to take 440 and I'm going to do the inverse or the, multiply by the reciprocal. So what does that mean? So here's the thing. What does it mean to be inversely proportional? It means if one thing goes up, the other thing goes down. So for example, if the string length goes down, guess what happens to the frequency? It goes up. That's the whole idea of inversely proportional. So what happened again? The String length, it, we multiply by 2 thirds to get that. The, the frequency we get by multiplying by 3 over 2. Inversely proportional. And so what we'll get here when we multiply this is going to be 660. So we can actually do those calculations quite nicely just like that. Yeah. So there we go. On the A string, we went and we multiplied by two-thirds to find out the length, to find out where we need to press in order to get a fifth above the E, from A to E. If you're on the same string, exactly. <laughs> so if I start on the A string, where on that same string do I need to press to get the fifth above? I need to make the string shorter, and it's going to be two-thirds as long, which if the string started out as 32.5 centimeters, I now could get out a tape measure, and I do this with my 10th grade for kicks. In the beginning, I say, okay, I'm going to play you 
and I get out the cello and I'm going to play Twinkle on the cello and I play the first two notes and I get out my tape measure and I measure it exactly where I need to do and I put my finger there and then I get the third note. Yeah, you can do that. It's not, it's not a very, it's not a very, it's a humorous way I suppose, it's not a very uh, musical way to play an instrument, but that's what I do. Not many music teachers teach. No, they don't, music teachers don't usually start with a tape measure. But there you go. So, um, did this example make sense to you? Okay. So what I can do is I could now, for example, if I want, now this was a C major scale. So we could imagine all of these notes. And, and, and again, I know for some people, and it gets beyond me a bit, um, the reason why I chose a C major scale is because there are no sharps and flats. And so we're going to see a little bit about where the sharps and flats come in. Don't let it bother you too much here. But these are those, all the intervals that I get if I were on a C string, if I were on a C string, the, and I could actually calculate where I need to be in order to get certain notes. For example, if I wanted to get the major third, if I wanted to get the E note on the C string, what would I do? I'd multiply the length of the whole cello string by four fifths, press my finger there, measure it out, press my finger there and play, and I'm guaranteed that I'd get an E. Yeah, it's really neat. And likewise, if I wanted to, I could calculate what the frequency would be, whatever the frequency of the C is, which I'm going to play with 264 in a moment. And to get that, I'm going to multiply by, well, I made the string shorter, so if the length gets less, the frequency goes higher, so I'm going to multiply by 5 over 4. So this is, by the way, this whole idea is called a diatonic scale. A diatonic scale, sometimes it's, it's referred to as just temperament or just intonation. I'm going to refer to it as a diatonic scale. And a diatonic scale allows me to create a musical scale that works with perfect ratios. So I'm starting out mostly for convenience sake, for mathematical convenience sake. I'm starting out with a C264 which would be um, something that I could get on a cello. No, the cello may even be lower than that. Yes, it is. There is a C string there. I'm trying to figure out where it's at. Um, yes, on the cello string. Ah, no, the C, sorry. The A string on a cello is 220. The violin A string is an octave higher than the A string on a cello. So it, yeah, the C string on the cello is the lowest, and that, and that one is two octaves lower than what I'm talking about here, actually. Okay. At any rate, let's imagine we have 264, a string that's vibrating 264 times per second, and now I can create this whole scale based upon these ratios right here. So let's just see it. How did I get from... How did I get the octave? Well, I multiplied to get the frequencies. I multiplied by 2 over 1, or just by 2. So I took 264, I doubled it. There's the octave higher. Let's do the fifth, because that's a nice, the next nice one, isn't it? How am I going to start with this frequency and get this number here? What did I do? I look here, and I, I wanted to make it go up. So I multiplied by 3 over 2. So this fifth was created by taking 264, multiplying by 3 over 2. It actually works. How do I get the fourth? I'm going to multiply by, start with 264, and multiply by 4 over 3. This is how, you know, this perfect ratio diatonic scale that the Pythagoreans loved, this is how they would create it. Now, they didn't have a scale as we know it. And by that's another, that's another odd thing is we call it the octave. Of course, how many notes are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We just listed the C twice, didn't we? But anyway, never mind. Um, all these confusing things. So now, so how did I get, we start with the root note every time. We go back to the root note, multiply by the ratio, and we produce all of these. How did I get the major third? Multiplied by five over four. Here, by nine over eight. Uh, what am I missing here? The A. The A, how do I get to A? C to A is the major 6, so I'm going to multiply by 5 over 3. And the poor 7th, 
and multiply by 15 over 8. Did I fill that out completely? So I did. Does this make sense? And here is where the whole thing falls apart. This is the scary moment. Because you could imagine this. This works. Let's just imagine that I, that I take my, my instrument that I've made you know, some hundreds of years ago, and it could be a harpsichord or a clavier, I'm, I'm calling it. But what is the uh, clavichord? Yeah, the clavichord. Um, we could take an instrument like that, and we could tune it perfectly to these frequencies. And that would be lovely. For what? A C major scale. But here's what happens. If I take that same instrument, and this is, this is a big moment here, if I take that same instrument and instead I'm not starting out with my fundamental root note as C, but imagine the same diagram, you'll see it in a moment, take that same diagram and what I'm going to do from this root note, I'm going to get the octave by multiplying by 2 over 1. From this note here, I'm going to get the fifth by multiplying by 3 over 2. And I'm going to go through the same process but starting with here. And this instead is what we get. Same process. But instead of starting with 264, I started with this. And what do you notice? The numbers aren't the same. The numbers don't quite. Now, I'm going to underline. I'm going to underline those things that do turn out to be exactly the same. What numbers, what notes did I create the same that were exactly the same? Those were the same. B was the same. So that's nice. OK, as long as I'm just playing Gs and Bs, I'm good. Um, what else is the same? Anything else? Well, the octave. Well, of course, D. Sure, I, I can underline that as well. That's fine. Now, what ones turn out to be way off? Most dramatically off. What's most dramatically off? So it's, if I really look at this, the F is considerably off. So this here is considerably off with this. And what else is considerably off? The C is considerably off. And what's just a little bit off? So the A is a little bit off. The A is a little bit off. And what are we, have we, what haven't we underlined yet? The E is a little bit off. OK? So what do we have to do to adjust for that? This is so far off that it's actually a different note. So a D major scale, one way of looking at why are the sharps and flats necessary, well, because as I just showed here, the numbers would be so far off, we have to do so we actually create another note. And that's where, of course, with the advent of the piano, you start having these black keys in between other keys. Yeah? But in a way, the most bothersome thing about this isn't the fact that we had to create totally different notes. But actually, the most bothersome thing is that now we have two notes in this scale that are off. They're not new notes. They're supposed to be the same note, but they're not. And that's a problem, especially for those people who are very sensitive in terms of how they hear. And the Pythagoreans should have said, we all should be that way. We should all be able to hear that difference. Right? So what happens here? So then we have, and without getting into all the dramatic history of it, we then have this need to do something about this. 